right. Hello, everyone. Welcome to this session on field marketing and digital engagement. I do have to warn you, we are a group that likes to have fun in here. So we're going to be super informal and this is going to be pretty engaging. We love to hear from you all as well. So I'm going to tell you who these three lovely folks are accompanying me in this conversation today. But first, I want to let you know that Rather than sitting back and eating your popcorn, although there are going to be some hot takes from uh, what I can tell, Daniel, <laughs> cough, cough. <laughs> but we want you to actually engage with us, make this live, make this entertaining. It's not in person, but this is the next best thing. So having said that, welcome. This is a bevy session on field marketing and digital engagement. Let me introduce first and foremost, we have hailing from Sendoso, uh, one of the preeminent folks in the space right now, Gabrielle Reichert. She's doing amazing things today with that brand, and I'm very excited to hear what her secret sauce is. We also have Alex Murcias, a Senior Manager of Field Marketing at Forge Rock, a really, really innovative company. Uh, Alex is an entrepreneurial guy, so that helps for those of us who maybe work for larger brands. He's going to show us how to get loose, get innovative, um, uh, but he's also a self-starter. And so, Alex, I'm going to want to hear some of those off the wall, off the beaten path ideas that maybe you've tried or haven't even tried but are thinking about. Last but certainly not least, we've got the mad scientist, <laughs> Daniel Madwin. He is the co-owner and founder of One Chance Media. Daniel is already starting to crisscross the country again. He's going to, goodness, did you say Columbus? It's Columbus, yes. It is Columbus, yes. okay. Uh, Daniel's going to be in Columbus at a live in-person event. Imagine that. So, yes, in-person events are coming back, but digital is not going anywhere. How do we merge the two? How do we make sure that these digital uh, engagements are actually engaging? So, with that being said, everybody, welcome. Thank you for being here. I'm excited to have you on. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Phenomenal. All right, folks. So I'm getting to learn about you guys just like our friends in the audience are. So I'm very selfishly just going to ask everything I've ever wanted to know. I've been, <laughs> I've been checking out your content on LinkedIn. And I want to know first and foremost, field marketing is sort of that interesting space where um, a lot of people who aren't in it maybe don't really appreciate how many parts of the business it influences. I want to know what attracted you guys to this space in the first place. And Gabrielle, I'd love to start with you. Why field marketing? Honestly, I love partnering with our sales team and our customer success team and figuring out what kind of events are going to move their deals along, what kind of events are going to make our customers happy. Um, I love all the partners we work with to put on these memorable experiences. Um, as everyone knows right now, relationships matter. They're very, very important. And I think the best way to continue those relationships is through virtual and ideally in-person events, but you know, we're getting back there slowly. Um, and also being able to bridge that the experience is actually building the, those relationships with content that's going to um, educate them and uh, help them make decisions in their careers and um, in the workforce. So uh, being able to bridge those memorable experiences with that educational content is, um, is why I'm here. All right. So I, I love that, Gabrielle. And you talked about memorable experiences. Um, I've got a lot of them, but Alex, I would love to maybe if we could delve into your mind and go back to your very first memorable experience, we're talking uh, events now, so let's keep it PG, but <laughs> stop laughing, Daniel, stay professional. <laughs> You're just smiling. You're so engaging. <laughs> so, Alex, I'd love to maybe know, like, what was one of the first events where it actually made an impression and an impact on you? Well, there have been a lot. Um, I, do you mean like virtual or like in person? Well, let's let's actually talk both. Like we're going back. I'll give you guys like, like an example. So this has nothing to do with field marketing specifically, but I want to use it to illustrate what the four of us well know and the audience as well, the power of a memorable experience. Uh, I grew up in Nigeria. I didn't grow up in the U.S., 
My first trip here was as a 10 year old. My parents saved up and flew myself and my two siblings to Orlando for three days at Disney World. Okay, that was three decades ago and I can narrate everything that happened. We're talking memorable. So Disney is one of those companies that we all know creates memorable experiences. And Alex, for you, what's like one personal story where it's like, man, I still remember when. Well, I was born and raised in Costa Rica and uh, so different culture, right? And so I started my career doing marketing there, um, mm. putting conferences and, you know, seminars, you know, managing the integrated channels and doing events in Latin America and then going to moving to the U.S. and doing events in the U.S. were completely different. Yeah. And I remember I was at the Austin Convention Center at this huge conference and it was just I, I was so impressed by the keynotes of mm. thought leaders, people who, um, you know, you may have a solution that's maybe about technology, but the keynote, it's about maybe how to improve your life and stuff like that. And, you know, kind of you mix that and that really got to me. And I was like, oh, it's really cool how they're using uh, all these channels all the, uh, to bring it up, to bring it back to their value prop, you know, so. Mm. Uh, that, that's really powerful. And, and, and Daniel, I'm going to want to come to you in just one moment. But uh, Alex, considering that you, ha you not only grew up in a different culture, Costa Rica, but you also ran events there, that is something that most of us on the session right now have not experienced. Maybe what's something that's unique about having events in, in a Costa Rican culture? Well, in Latin America, it's a very collective society. So um, you can see people like, you know, when COVID hit, we're talking about, hey, should we, should we be shaking hands? Mm. In Latin America, it's like, should we be kissing our cheeks, <laughs> right? Because it's very <laughs> collective. You'll notice that the booth spaces are smaller. People like to uh, be a little more close together and have more mm. of like, you know, ice breaking activities. So it's very collective. Whereas in the US, we do have a lot of that, but we, we do need a little bit more space. We need our three feet in the US, don't yeah. we? Although now, uh, coming out of the quarantine, I have tended to uh, hug random people in grocery stores, which is probably a habit I need to break. <laughs> Daniel, with that in mind, help me out. So field marketing, you got started in, in this space and you've been running events here. I think you've been based in the US for the most part. Yeah, not exclusively. Yeah. Awesome. So I'd love to sort of hear maybe one of those memorable experiences early in your career that sort of made you realize this was an area you really wanted to double down on. Yeah, well, I mean, do we want to go in like the Disney World route story or do we want to go in the more professional story? I, I want to get that personal first. Yeah. And then let's pivot to the professional because you know what? I think the professional, a lot of times there are certain lanes or tracks where you're, we, we know you're supposed to do this, you're supposed to do that. But sometimes we can learn just like as B2B marketers, we learn a lot from B2C. I want to hear from your personal experience and what made it so memorable. And then let's flip that to the professional. Yeah, well, so getting into like events and organization and connecting people probably started in the eighth grade for myself. I went to a okay. private school and in order to go on our eighth grade trip, you had to raise your own funds to like, you know, take the class. Mm -hmm. So I, I'll try to keep it really brief. I like kind of am very type A and I took it upon myself to kind of lead our charge in fundraising. So we organized like community i went to a jewish school so we organized like community dinners for like different holidays and different mm. events that you know happen across the year whether that was like calling people up making sure that they're getting reservations organizing the um you know the auction the silent auction or organizing the food delivery all that stuff kind of started then and at that point you know that kind of started the whole organization bringing people together for like a common goal creating an experience that you know people enjoy because if we're doing an event in the fall we want them to come back in the spring because we still need to raise money so all that stuff kind of carried through so that's kind of what i would say started um mm. all of the foray into the event world mm. um and then from a professional sense you know we uh, my brother and I started this as a way to save up for a car, our company. We commuted no to high, sc high school in New York. We're from Connecticut. And so we were approached, our family's in the photography business. So we were approached, you know, 
would you do the photo experiences at so-and-so's bat mitzvah? And we thought, great, we'll save up for a car and then, you know, let bygones be bygones. Mm -hmm. And so I would say there was like a culmination of throughout high school, really like seeing the impact of our business in terms of, I mean, like what 14 year old, 15 year old really comprehends like the impact that you have on someone's life and Hmm. us being a part of memorable events. Like we really started in the social event world, like, and seeing how we can impact that and make, you know, an impact for people on a small scale. And then as we've moved and matured and moved into larger, you know, corporate and B2C and B2B facing events, it's Mm -hmm. the same thing of how are we making this memorable and impactful for people? Because everybody has a million things to do. So if they're going to take the time to be at your event, um, you want to make sure that they're walking away with a positive experience. I love it. It's very started from a very young age up until now. I love it. I love it. Man, Daniel took us back. He was like, it was a dark and stormy night. Yeah. (laughs) You inspired me with Orlando. I love it. No, I actually want to build off of something that you said there. And and as I do it, I'm going to ask our our friends in the audience. Remember, I said this is going to be interactive now. I said this is going to be informal. Look, I'm nosy. So I just shared my Disney World story. And Daniel just shared his uh, bat mitzvah story and how he was raising money in eighth grade. I want to hear your personal memory. What was your first memorable experience, right? So, guys, go ahead and type that in the chat. But while they're typing that, Daniel, you actually said something that that stuck with me. And I want to get Gabrielle's opinion on it, okay? So it sounds like as you and your brother started to have these events, you almost didn't do them as one and dones. You almost didn't say, okay, we have this goal. We want to raise this much money. Once we got that money, we're like, see ya, wouldn't want to be ya. You know, we got the car. We're, 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 we're out of here. 1.21 gigahertz. And <laughs> we still have that car, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> so really no one and done. There you go. There you go. And, and Gabrielle, you had mentioned a few minutes earlier that one of the things you love about field marketing is partnering with sales. We mm-hmm. love our, our friends in sales. Without the sales professionals, there is no business. But sometimes our sales colleagues can have that uh, quota hanging over their head, that quarterly quota, which mandates that they have to have a relatively short-term focus, right? Yeah. So as a field marketing professional, you love your audience. You know your audience, Gabrielle. How mm-hmm. are you balancing the needs of the salesperson to close deals this quarter with the needs of your attendees to not only have a positive and memorable experience, Mm -hmm. but to Daniel's point, to want to come back for the next one. I think um, having a mix of different events. So I think you should definitely partner with industry partners on their third party conferences. So you constantly have new leads coming in. Um, But then also putting on your huge virtual events or in person once we're back to that to actually um, really reach all your prospects and customers, and then um, sprinkling in smaller field events in there. So partnering right now, we're partnering with our enterprise um, field team on targeting their specific accounts they're trying to reach. We're doing virtual wine tastings. We're doing magic shows. We're doing experiences that are memorable, um, but they're on a smaller scale. So we're not having to put a landing page together. We're not having to drive like huge registration, but we are reaching the right people. Um, So I think having a well-balanced mix of events and then having those few more personalized events that you can pull out towards the end of the quarter or towards the end of the month um, that that are focused on the accounts they're really trying to Mm. pull before the end of the month or the end of the quarter. Man, I appreciate that, Gabrielle, because sometimes, you know, you, you give us marketers a hammer and everything looks like a nail. You know, sometimes we, we might have a one track mind and say, you know, I want to do this type of event. What you seem to be illustrating is that we actually have a, a toolbox or, or we have several different um, um, weapons that we can deploy depending on the goal. And you're actually suggesting we should, we should have a portfolio of events. Um why don't we brainstorm a little bit and sort of share with the folks maybe what some of those field event type category you, you started to mention them gabrielle but alex mm-hmm. maybe you could start to paint the picture of some of those event types yeah i want to actually take it back for a second because i hear 
yes, field marketing is a lot about events. Yeah. But it's all channels in the field, right? It's a, the ability to leverage direct mail, digital, uh, advertising, seminars, trade shows, uh -oh. webinars, conferences, Shots all higher. of that at a hyper local level to generate pipeline for your sales team. So I, I often, and I'm sure the audience that's listening, they, they think of field events like, uh uh, wait a second. My, most of my time is spent on making decisions based on the data to drive that revenue, right? And, and then activating those campaigns. So, um, so a little bit of there. And then in terms of like events, you know, we have webinars, we have smaller round table virtual events. We have seminars, we have um, trade shows and conferences who are not always the same. Um, we have tastings, magic shows like Gabrielle indicated. We have uh, expo only type of events. Uh, we have uh, speed dating events where you go and identify your target accounts and you, you do short meetings with those target accounts and lots of different events. I hope I was able to answer your question. Uh, yes. Uh, first of all, Alex is feeling feisty today. <laughs> <laughs> he is, uh, he's challenging everything. Alex is going to be our problem child. I can already tell. That's what they though. <laughs> we could work with you. I like that. And I appreciate you sort of pushing the envelope. We, we don't necessarily only have to think about events. I, I, I want to marinate on that for a little bit. Um, um, Daniel, you know, you, you've been doing this with your brother for a little bit. What are some of the things that maybe we're not thinking of as field marketers? Well, we deal with a lot of different types of field marketers and where we fit in from a company perspective is we provide different types of engagement activities. So mm -hmm. prior to COVID, a lot of it was in-person engagement activities. Then mm -hmm. when COVID started, we transitioned to online engagement activities. And now we are focusing on people that are doing in-person events, online events, and obviously connected or hybrid events as well. Mm -hmm. um, so I'm not an expert in the field marketing role, so I'm never one to tell someone how to do their job or what to do. But I would just say that like, whatever, whenever someone's talking to us about our services, my always thought is like, if I was in the shoes of the individual participating, is this gonna like mean something to me? Is this gonna resonate mm. with me? Um, and how is it going to help me? Um, just because that's the advice that I was given from a long time ago is like, you always have to think about when you're selling something, not like what you're selling to someone, but how's it gonna help them and thinking about it that way. So I think as like we approach these different types of events, I think sometimes you don't wanna like splatter and do everything because that one might be overwhelming, two might be a waste of resources and three, it might not have like the impact that you would want. So I would say in terms of like what is missing, it depends on the situation, but I think, you know, sometimes there's now, this might be like that off-candid thing. I think a lot of times, like us who are as professionals doing this day in and day out are a little bit jaded in the sense mm. of like saying, oh, I've done this before. Like I need to do something new for this group of people who in fact have never seen like your base thing that works typically. And maybe that would be a better fit than trying to like overcomplicate something. Um, so I just think that's very important and sometimes, you know, and from a selling perspective, I would love to sell the most complex service and charge the most for it. But if you don't have a good experience with it, then you're not, that's going to leave a sour taste in your mouth. So I think oftentimes people have to sort of take a step back and think about who is my audience mm -hmm. and I'm not serving myself, you know? Mm -hmm. So that would be my thing that I feel like is sometimes missing in marketing in general. So marketers with empathy I, I don't know this is too new age for me daniel i'm gonna have to sit with that one for a little bit <laughs> i like that okay fair enough daniel um but i'm gonna play devil's advocate so you're essentially saying you made a couple of really salient points that i heard one was we don't always have to innovate for innovation's sake i guess if we're focusing on the end result which is making the event memorable and also meeting our business goals. Hat tip, Gabrielle, we always have to keep that in mind. Innovation <laughs> to, to the nth degree may not meet those goals. So that's fair. But Scott asked a, a brilliant question in the audience, and I want to present this to Gabrielle. Um, Scott is essentially saying, okay, Daniel, that's all well and good. You know, we're, we're going to hug all of our attendees and, and sing and hold hands. But how are we balancing 
meeting the demand generation goals with also creating those memorable community experiences, doing the customer nurturing or, or the prospect nurturing and so on. Um, is it possible, Gabrielle, to actually do both in a single event or do we have to go with the portfolio approach you talked about earlier? Mm -hmm. Help this make sense for us. I think um, you could do it. I mean, I prefer the portfolio approach and doing several different events and incorporating them. Um, I think if you really want to make a huge impact in one event, and this is also something I believe in along with the portfolio, is I think if you host virtual event and then on the side you had a customer happy hour the evening before that's virtual or you, and you have breakout sessions that um are specific to different prospects needs and stuff so you can in one larger event um partner with your partners and have them sponsor the event so they're also contributing um i think that would probably be the best way to hit it all in just one day but mm -hmm. um it's important to have designated events just for certain accounts, smaller scale things um, that really give them the VIP experience beyond just that one big day event with breakout sessions and maybe a happy hour the night before or something. Yeah, that is interesting. That is interesting. And I, I'm going to want to sort of get people's thoughts and in the audience as well, in terms of how one potentially, if you're doing the portfolio approach, Gabrielle, I can see my management saying, oh, this is uh, this is uh, an event that is specifically going to accelerate pipeline or bring in new deals. Blank check. <laughs> oh, this is one of those uh, wine tasting events that Daniel's always talking about. <laughs> uh. <laughs> so I'll be interested to sort of get us all thinking, like if the portfolio event sounds compelling to me, Gabrielle, I'm with you on it. I'm just wondering how easy it might be to get executive buy-in for some events versus others. But let's sort of sit with that thought for a little bit and we're gonna circle back to it. Um, I wanna double click, Alex, on what you talked about in terms of not pigeonholing ourselves just to events. Um, so we're gonna put you on the hot seat now, Alex. Okay, so hey, you called us out. So, <laughs> so now we're, we're gonna ask you directly, like what are some of the things like um, direct mail, Sendoso, for example, mm -hmm. Can you give us some plays? Give us some things that have worked. And, and you know what? Don't just give us the good stuff. Tell us the all the, the 99 experiments that failed before, you know, <laughs> before you hit on the home run. Give us the whole picture. I mean, I feel like I'm taking Gabby's talk track because you work for Sendoso, <laughs> but um, I'm a huge fan of Sendoso. I've been leveraging the tool to um, elevate our touch points with those prospects and customers. There's really so many, there are really so many options you can leverage. Um, some of them are based on events. At the beginning of the transition to COVID, um, I was running a lot of like um, direct mail based campaigns that for like holiday time, Christmas, Thanksgiving, uh, New Year's, it was like a great way to connect with prospects. And then uh, as we started like this year, I started incorporating those direct mails um, you know swag and all that stuff with activity that's already planned as a collateral and not as a standalone driver for that because people got tired right people get tired mm. it's like oh in return for like a box with like i don't know gift card or something like that am i gonna meet with you right it's more like about the experience so it's like we started doing um i started doing stuff like wine tastings where you know, the, we partner with Sendoso. Sendoso partners with In Good Taste, for example, and we're able to put together holistic activities. Now, beyond pre and post mm -hmm. um, event, you also have to engage them, keep them connected, because uh -huh. their emails, uh, their meetings go all over the place, especially in this uh, virtual world. So if you don't keep them engaged, they're more likely to deprioritize your event Although they registered, you send in the stuff. And so you have to keep them engaged before. So you may want to do stuff like, I don't know, a gift card for like lunch or something like that prior. And then wrapping it up with the cherry on top after the event. How do you wrap it up? What do you give the account executive as a way to, again, connect with that prospect? Mm. Use a send of somehow, some way, you know, something mm. that that person might be interested in and then connect them with afterwards. So it's a whole journey. And it's just not the event and then we just drop right it's mm. it connects 
I like that. I like that. And, and Gabrielle, I hope you will you will bear with me. I wanted to ask Alex specifically the Sendoso question uh, so he could give you a testimonial. So, <laughs> so Alex, Alex is you got an A plus. Alex, you can reach out to me afterwards, Gabby. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, let's send him some wine or something. But but that is interesting. Um, a, a lot of us and, and folks are sort of show, doing a show of hands who's used direct mail, whether Sendoso or otherwise. People maybe don't recognize the breadth of things that you could do with with um, direct a direct mail service like a Sendoso. Um, but Daniel, I want to sort of ask. Alex hit on something fascinating there, in which he said, yes, you're doing the wine tasting or some other sort of engaging event, but because people are busy and because to a certain extent there's like Zoom fatigue, you want to make sure they get to the event. So he's talking about engaging them before and after. Um, so whether it's standing outside of their window with the boom box or some other way of staying engaged with them, <laughs> writing handwritten letters, Daniel, what are some ways, is this something you guys are doing? A and if so, what are some of the ways that you're keeping people engaged before and after the event? Yeah, so we offer a variety of services to our clients. Now, just as again, disclaimer for everybody who's on this you know, session, we're not the planners of these events. We are facilitating what our planners and our clients would like to do. So mm -hmm. we really have two types of services that I kind of describe them when I'm doing a call with someone who's learning about options. I call them like on demand and live. So mm -hmm. on demand services are services that people can do at any time at their leisure, which I think is so important now, especially after like having done virtual for so long, like people are just used to doing things on their own time when they want to, because they're just juggling a lot while home. So I think from like a pre-event, you know, engagement standpoint, there's a lot of different like on-demand activities that customers of ours can do, you know, whether it's like a pre-event game or pre-event quiz, you know, that they can, that someone can do on their own time. Um, or maybe it's a submitting a photo to, you know, of our photo mosaic form so that way like they can be a part of you know the mosaic there's like a on-demand thing that someone can do um then during the event we obviously have our live services so again that's more things that are happening in real time if you are not there you're gonna miss it and so that's kind of like the hook you know in terms of these services that we've already talked about we don't do things like mag shows wine tasting things like that i would consider that more entertainment we do you know things like the trivia that we did before the event started or a live caricature artist, which, you know, again, shameless plug, we have in our booth, you know, in the networking lounge, or we do our live scribe, which is again, something that we did during the event. Those are things that you want to see and happen in real time. So mm -hmm. I would say that's sort of how we approach it with giving advice to our customers is that mm -hmm. you want to do your, obviously your mix of on demand as well as live. So that way there's a reason for someone to show up. And I think, you know, to Alex's point and in terms of like prioritizing things and whatnot, like, you know, you can sign up for something, you're sitting at home, your kid comes home or something yeah. else happens and then you're like not gonna attend the event. So you obviously wanna make it an event that someone wants to attend and is able to attend. But you also, I think, have to consider like maybe things should be a little bit more on demand so that way people can still participate, but at their leisure. So that's yes. what I would say was our approach to that. Uh, I love, man, okay, Daniel. Daniel's not holding back, y'all. I, I tell you, Daniel is, they told me Daniel was competitive. I think he's trying to, he's trying to win. An, I am an ENTJ, if that's <laughs> for anyone, so. Uh, there we go. There, there you go. Same, the two same. problem children. I, I, I see, I see. Well, I, I, I'm going to come back to, to Gabrielle because I, I do like that demarcation, Daniel, of on demand versus live in terms of maintaining engagement before and after. I, I never even thought about it like that. But Gabrielle, talk to me a little bit about Zoom fatigue. I mean, we're beating up on Zoom. It's like, you know, the, the term Xerox now. We're just using it to describe all things, you know, online live engagement. But to a certain extent, because of COVID, a lot of us are on these calls all day and then there's an event coming up. It's a compelling, it's a topic we're interested in, but to a certain extent, it's the same or a similar medium. So 
how are you guys at Sendoso sort of combating that? And are you starting to think of hybrid activities or still se you're separating in person and online? Um, that is a great question. And that is, you know, something I think we're also figuring out the combating Zoom fatigue. Um, a lot of what we've been saying is these virtual wine tastings. I hate to have to say it again, uh, but those interactive experiences where it's beyond just like watching a webinar like you can draw have like a 10 minute product roadmap or invite an executive to come in make an intro talk about your company and then move into a more laid back networking experience where people aren't just sitting there listening to a conversation or listening to a webinar that you've put on. Um, we are moving actually into hybrid. We have an event coming up in September, um, also called Connected. And we will, we're filming from an in-person site in San Francisco. Okay. So we're live streaming. Um, and that way people are looking at something a little different than the different. regular Zoom background or, you know, just regular, like people sitting in their offices. Um, it does kind of help people to feel like they're at, like watching a gra the Grammys or something where it's just mm. like seeing people interact. Um, we're not quite ready to start bringing attendees in person yet. Um, I, we're just, you know, taking one step at a time. And the first step is hybrid and having our speakers live, but then having our attendees still enjoying from home. Um, so I think a lot of people are going to start, you know, live streaming from in-person venues. And I know, um, I know Six Sense did a great job at that a few months ago as well. And um, they also had like a live band perform and they um, live streamed all of that. So entertainment options, um, ways to grab people's attention beyond just like a webinar or a content piece um, is important to do. Mm. Mm -hmm. I, I like that. And, and that is interesting. We've talked about hybrid. I did ask everyone to take a drink every time we say hybrid on here. Uh, it can be water. It can be coffee. That's okay. But it is 5 p.m. somewhere. But So there's this, Alex, let's kind of, let's kind of uh, build on what Gabrielle is talking about in terms of when you go hybrid versus when you go full in person and, and how you're sort of managing that mix. What are you guys thinking about your company? Well, I can tell you what I'm thinking about, um, which is it depends. And we were talking about this uh, a few days back on the local guidelines. Like if you're a film marketer, if you, you manage a specific region, you cannot compare that specific region with another region and treat them all both the same. And so That's your fair. portfolio of virtual versus in-person versus hybrid might look a little bit different. For mm -hmm. example, Costa Rica is experiencing a huge wave of COVID right now. Mm. You don't want to do an in-person event there. <laughs> However, That'd be a bad idea. yeah. So I manage the east of the United States, and I like to, you know, for for the second half of the year, we do have a uh, few smaller gatherings that are uh, in person, and some that are fully virtual. The hybrid approach is through um, touch points in the journey leveraging tools like Sendoso. Mm. Um, and for example, I think a lot of people think about, about, hey, we have to do the event the same day, offer it to virtual and in-person. What about you record the in-person and then make that virtual and then offer it as a program in and on itself, you know, during a separate date. Uh, mm. And then entice some rewards within that program to make people excited about attending. Uh, I've seen platforms for conferences that will um, promote a lot of like leaderboard, the more visits to booths and like downloading content, the more points you get and people get really excited about things like that. Um, I would say that for the, now that a lot of the states have been opening up, uh, the mass mandates have been reduced. Um, I'll be surprised if someone's a portfolio events for each two has more than 30% of in-person events compared to the entire portfolio. That, I think that's a red flag. Now, this is my personal opinion, um, but I think something fares anywhere from 20% in-person events for now based on mm -hmm. what your region is looking at. Um, although your company may be ready to travel, it doesn't mean that those big accounts that you're going after will be ready to travel wow. or that your account executives will be able to travel. So a piece of advice that I'll give to my fellow marketers is when you're building the plan and as you're putting that plan together and cities and whatnot, 
do yeah. talk, talk to yourself uh, um, to your account executives and SDRs to see how comfortable they feel with traveling because if you put wow. an event on their plan that they don't feel comfortable with traveling most likely you know you need their partnership to succeed so man flamethrower this is, <laughs> this is good I never honestly I never thought about that uh, um I, I was speaking to a friend in a different community Revenue Collective a couple of weeks ago. Mm -hmm. uh, this gentleman is Indian. He works in the US, though, where I work as well. And we're just chatting it up. Hey, how's things going? He's like, oh, you know, sorry for the delay in getting back to you. Uh, I just got my parents into a hospital last week. They both have COVID. I was like, whoa. And he said, I'm one of the lucky ones. There's a lot of people who get COVID and there's no beds available. So the experience is very, very different to your point, Alex, from one country to the next and sometimes even within countries. Mm -hmm. Very, very insightful thoughts there. Um, I'm wondering, Daniel, how you're sort of managing this transition, this march back to it's like the, the, the sunset of COVID, right? It, eventually it's going to come, we're, we're, we're getting close to it. But how are you managing this transition for yourself and for your clients? So I would say a lot of our clients, you know, we work a lot in experiential and trade shows and, you know, people that really have been itching to get back to live events. So I would say for right now, a lot of the stuff that we're talking to people about, yes, we are talking about some virtual opportunities, but there's been a complete switch to mm. talking about in person. Mm. Um, and kind of not really with like too many restrictions in those conversations. And again, we service the nation. So we're talking to people planning events like all over the country. Um, and so I, th I think that people, you know, are just having this, I've been doing virtual for so long. I want to go back to what I know and I'm going to go back to live. And I think that's just mm -hmm. like what's going to happen. Like, yes, of course there are different companies. And again, we're working with more so agencies and like, and, planners so we're not like the brand itself like alex or gabrielle who might have to you know decide what their company policies are we're dealing with like a variety mm -hmm. of things but the variety that we deal with are currently in person mm -hmm. um but then for us moving into the future i think that this is just a reaction and that after some time once people have kind of gotten out of their system and have been back to normal people are going to see how online and virtual or hybrid or connected, whatever it might be, um, has a place, especially for disconnected teams that are not like in the same area or yeah. global events that, you know, you never thought was possible to connect everybody mm. um, or even understanding a new solution for the dissemination of information. I think that's going to be huge, you know, in terms of people who just like can't make it to places or companies or brands who just don't want to put the bill for like, flying people to go someplace when they can clearly educate them and mm. engage them online. Right now, I think just people have, are getting that fatigue in general. So yeah. not thinking about it that way, but in a year from now, just funny, like I'm in the New York area, you would feel like COVID like wasn't even a thing anymore. Like it's just mm. like not a concept. So I think people eventually are gonna forget like this Zoom fatigue and then they're gonna come back to, oh, like this makes sense. So. For us planning into the future, I mean, we are focused right now pretty much back to live because that's what a lot of our clients are asking, but that's on the client facing side. Yes. Internally, we are working on and continue to work on our partnerships and our services for online events or connected events because that will for sure have different people that will now just be continuing to use that into the future because it wasn't an option before. And yeah. the past year and a half like forced that adoption very quickly. So wow. that's kind of how we're approaching it right now. Wow, wow, wow. Hey, hey Gabrielle, you, you got you got to talk to me here. So you're coming from a brand perspective. So Daniel sort of made the distinct the distinction, right, between how he's thinking about it for his clients. Mm -hmm. um, but I'd love to hear from the brand perspective. And I want to sort of leverage something that Daniel didn't say the term, but but I've heard it a few places in the hallways here at Bevy, uh, virtual hallways. Um, yeah. In person, it's this concept of in person plus, Gabrielle, where we're all eager for real human interaction again. We want to mm -hmm. see our colleagues and you know get to touch people and sit shoulder to shoulder with them. But Daniel brought up a point, like there have been connections that have happened over the past year plus 
that simply could not take place for a myriad of reasons, a multitude of reasons. And there's also benefits, like Daniel said, like, are you going to fly 10 of your employees across the country and spend thousands of thousands when you could get maybe 70, 80 percent of that benefit from an in-person plus type of event? So how is Sendoso thinking about going back to in-person finally, <laughs> but still saving some of those unique benefits of virtual? Um, I think like you were saying, Daniel, being able to connect with people across the country is something that, and on the fly. So you can like three mm. plan a virtual magic show or whatever, something that you can have your account executives meet, you know, five people that are in the New York office at their top account, 10 people that are in the LA office and have one meeting with all of them without on the fly a few weeks beforehand. So I think that's something that, um, will continue to take advantage of. Um, I do not think that virtual will ever be as strong as those in-person connections. I just think those in-person connections are so important for building relationships, but I do think virtual will still be so important for delivering information um, and providing those more educational uh, conversations. But in terms, like nothing beats taking someone out to dinner and having a conversation across the table from each other, um, seeing people on video, there is just a level of disconnect. There is a divide there. Um, so I, I, I think in rule over that, but uh, the benefits of virtual being able to meet on the fly, being able to bring, you know, thousands and thousands of people together at a much lower cost. Mm -hmm. That's something we're kind of dealing with right now is we're mm -hmm. creating in-person events to sponsor and they're like, okay, well, we can't have the full 2000 people there that we normally have with COVID restrictions. So we're only going to have 500, but it's going to cost you more to sponsor the has for our virtual events where we've given you 2000 leads you now will get 500 leads for a lower cost you also have to pay teeny for your team to fly out there um so you really i think there will be a little bit of a trial and error period um and seeing how going back to in person with these COVID regulations will be because it will just be restricted the number of people that can meet um i kind of went on a tangent there i guess from your original question but um I think I think virtual will continue to stay important, uh, but in terms of those like those building those relationships and your sales team seeing their top accounts um, in person will will always be number one for that. Mm, mm. Yeah, that <laughs> it is a conundrum. I mean, it almost feels like there's there's a spectrum of zero to one hundred in terms of uh, you know virtual to in person. And to your point, Gabrielle, I think each company is going to have to figure out where they, they want. We, have, we might almost have to experiment. Um, but, yeah. but for now, the virtual events lobbyists say you are against virtual events because didn't sing their I am definitely <laughs> cool then. I've been amazed by the number of leads and the number of people we've been able to reach from virtual events. I mean, huh. in person is only like a third of normally these events that we're sponsoring, we're able to get in contact with, you know, three times the number of people than we have, than we're able to in person because they're mm -hmm. just more people. Um, mm -hmm. So, so in terms of really getting your brand out there on a large scale, mm -hmm. um, virtual events will continue to be really important too. And that's something I should have added. <laughs> but, mm, too little, too late. I think, it I think it depends on your audience. Okay. actually because some organizations like i'm a i'm a regional film market manager right but we could have someone here in the audience who managed the, the entire portfolio for the united states right mm -hmm. and they have to be able to scale they say they're doing webinars they're doing uh virtual roundtables they're also helping write some sales and development content to keep those sales motions going like and he's the only person maybe for an organization right for that person in terms of bandwidth and resources might make more sense to do a virtual event where they use um, experiences like Sendoso to continue to keep them active, right? Whereas in a different month, they might be able to do like an in-person event in a specific area because there's mm -hmm. a higher density of target accounts there. Mm -hmm. So I think it just it depends on your go-to-market strategy and what your audience looks like as well. 
Okay. Yeah, that's an insightful uh, addition, Alex. And it goes back to almost to Gabrielle's earlier point about us having a portfolio and, and feeling empowered. And this also double clicks on your early point, Alex, about not pigeonholing our vision or putting on those um, blinders in terms of what we're allowed to do. If we're focusing on the end goal, whether it's to get a certain number of uh, pipeline accounts or target accounts or nurture a certain number of um, companies, then we should be able to figure out which which tool is going to work most effectively. Um, I do want to start to get into some of the questions. There's some fascinating questions here, but I, but this is a really rich conversation. And, and so as I pivot to the questions, I'd love to ask the three of you, Daniel, uh, we could start with you, um, thinking about success metrics, whether it's hybrid, in-person, or virtual, how should field mar manage uh, marketers ultimately be thinking up about measuring whether this was a success or not? Yeah, so that's a great question for our services because so many times it's our services are pretty quantifiable. Like how mm. many photos did you take? How many people participated? You know, et cetera, et cetera. So when I think about that in terms of how we talk about it with our clients, I think there's two, you know, to my like, earlier statements, I think there's really two approach to it. Like you have your quantifiable, like how many people mm -hmm. did participate in this? Like clearly, you know, you know, a number of people, was this a good ROI? Like, did we have a number of people participate in our game? A number of people participate, you know, in our um, trivia or whatever it might be, or photo booth, or how many people stopped by our booth at our live event? Mm. Um, but then I also think beyond that, it depends on what the purpose of the event is and what the purpose mm -hmm. of these experiences are. So like, for example, in when it comes to like in-person events, we've done many and we've talked about them online. We've done many like influencer events where you don't necessarily care about the cost per se in that moment for that per person. Because for you, what makes a difference is just making that like experience phenomenal for them. So they walk away being like, this was like an incredible experience. I That's have good. loved this brand, whatever. That's good. But then on the flip side, it could be a matter of like, I mean, we work with a number of, you know, beverage companies and like they are so like just numbers driven, like and food companies too. It's like, how many samples did I give it at this event? So similarly, they're like, well, how many sessions did I take, you know, at this particular event? So I think that you kind of have to define what is the purpose. That's what we always go back to, like, what is the purpose? Why are you using our services? That's mm -hmm. always kind of our questioning because we want to sort of align expectations and set things up to be the best that they can be. Mm -hmm. But at the end of the day, like, we can't necessarily control what happens. We can only provide you all the tools to make it successful. But I would say from a metrics of success, you have your clear cut, like, how many people did X, Y, Z? Mm. But then also beyond that, it should be about what was the purpose of doing this and did that purpose get accomplished? Like, did we make people, you know, yeah. feel good? Did we make people share this content on social media? And you have different services or different events for those different goals. So. Mm. Mm. That's awesome. That's awesome, Daniel. And um, I, I want to get you guys' take on this. Alex, I'm going to jump to you next. Uh, this this ties into a, a stream of questions that Jeffrey in the audience is asking today. Thank you for the really insightful questions, Jeffrey. So Jeffrey essentially is sharing that um, he's asking whether field marketers might also almost need to add some level of event production or, or content production skills to their skill set in terms of being able to make virtual events richer. And he gives an example of a podcast. I think uh, he mentions D a Dave Chappelle podcast. I haven't checked it out. I definitely will be checking it out after this session. That's a good, good uh, mention. Where Dave is not just doing the interview format, but he's including some pre-recorded content. He is mixing in some music, a motivational quote. These are things that you can't necessarily do in a live event, but in virtual, especially if you're not limiting yourself to live, all of a sudden you have, it's almost like painting with more colors. So Alex, I'd love to get your take on maybe this, this as we go back to the future, ultimately we want engagement and we want business results, but are there some innovative ways that field marketers could start thinking about this? 
Yes, of course. So I don't know if you recall whenever COVID started happening and all the live events started getting canceled, uh, a lot of people who had event roles got laid off. Yes. And the ones that didn't, the role was changed to a film marketing, marketing, integrated marketing. And uh, I remember I'm part of the community uh, on Slack. I think it's called film marketing for the win. Um, and I remember a lot of folks asking, hey, I've never done film marketing before. Mm. How do I even start putting together a film marketing plan? And mm. uh, and, and the reason why I bring this up is because it, it challenges your experience, the way you think about events, um, the way that you design the production work, the bandwidth, the resources that go into these events. So everybody's having virtual events today. Yeah. Not many people are having in-person events, right? And I believe Gabby said earlier that people do value the in-person. I completely agree. But virtual events to give you access to bandwidth and availability that some of those C-suite titles that you're going after may not mm. have. So for example, you get up, you go drive, you, you get ready, you shower, you, you go and park, you walk all the way to the meeting room and how much time have you invested there, right? With virtual events, you can be wearing pajamas. You guys already know if I'm wearing pajamas or shorts right now, right? <laughs> so, so, so it does, so to, to the virtual part, there is the the production work. Um, the, some things are easier, but when, mm -hmm. when it comes to hybrid, it really challenges you and you have to be more creative. Mm -hmm. People most likely have already attended a wine tasting, a bourbon tasting, a magic show. They've already probably received a mug from with your brand on it. What are you going to different to do different mm -hmm. and how are you gonna personalize that experience? It may be, I don't know, I set up a call with um, I don't know, Daniel, and I want to do something really cool for him that I know that he'll really like, um, just because I know we have conversations before. Uh, it, it's it's really, it's gonna be a big challenge. And then the other piece that I wanted to touch base on, I know I'm like deviating a little bit here, is whenever we went to virtual events, you'll recall that all those third party vendors probably kept their sponsorship costs the same. And now that they're going back to virtual or hybrid, they're elevating their costs, right? And so if your branding is going to be on both at an in-person and in virtual, you have expenses in both dimensions. So how is that going to impact your, your resources and your, and your bandwidth? And that goes back to the production level, right? You have to have both a digital and a physical experience for those prospects. Mm. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. This is really interesting. Um, um, Andre Luis Oliveira, uh, Oliveira, pardon me, had an interesting question. This is going to your point, Alex, about having not only the virtual, but the physical experience. So with the virtual, you, you can, to a certain extent, replicate sights, right, and sounds, but Beyond that, it starts to get a little dicey. So he's actually asking about smells. This might actually, Daniel, I don't know if you've got anything in your back pocket. <laughs> Andre wants to know, how are we getting smell? Like, we want smell o vision My mom actually asked about this last week. <laughs> so uh, are there any innovative technologies that might continue, that you've heard of, that might continue to advance virtual events along the spectrum of making them more like in person? I thought you said spells, first of all, and I was very confused. I'm like, I'm not into astrology that much, so I cannot answer that so well. Um, smells, great question. Honestly, probably something to do with some packaging that's not necessarily our forte, so I'm not gonna you know, go out on a limb. So you, you definitely stumped me <laughs> in terms of like what we could do with like smells and whatnot. Um, but I, I mean, I'm not like, I mean, we are in technology, but I don't say that I'm like a technology expert. I kind of think there's two ways that you can go about mm -hmm. doing it. You can really make it like an immersive, ex as much of an immersive experience as you can with mm -hmm. engagement on like a 2D screen, you know, with like the way you develop your website or the way that you develop your program. Like I would say that was probably my takeaway from virtual is that people can really, to what 
Gabrielle said before, like really create like an experience that kind of looks like an award show or much mm. better production value than like, I think what people thought these brands could do. Mm -hmm. but, again, not our like vertical, but I would just say that's something cool that I've noticed. Mm -hmm. But then on the technology side, I mean, once you start getting into, and I've never put it on because I just think like I would go crazy with them. But once you get into the headsets mm -hmm. and you can kind of feel like immersive in that sense, I feel like that's a really great way to take your online event to the next level. Yeah. But that's an accessibility issue that I think people are still sort of figuring out. But I would say that's kind of like the divide is either you're making your like online event, like gamified, but not gamified, like with like little tricks and whatnot, but like truly gamified, like game theory that people use to create these like addicting games that kids and adults play all the time. Um, or you are really going into like fully immersing someone in, like a headset experience, mm -hmm. I would say, but that's like a whole nother can of worms. So. Yeah. 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 I, I like how you answered that question. And, and Andre, thank you for stumping stumping the guests. <laughs> I did ask for tough questions. Um, smell -o vision might not be, you know, on the horizon in the next couple of years, but uh, I like the fact that it's sort of stretching us to think, how do we, how can we get the engagement level on virtual closer and closer to in-person? We'll never get a hundred percent there, but how do we start to get it closer and closer? Um, Gabrielle, I'd love to circle back with you as our time starts to wind up and really ask, you know, ultimately we're thinking about this. We, we're using the term back to the future for this very fun session. There's innovations that are here now. Sendoso uh, pioneers a lot of them. Um, Daniel's company is pioneering a lot of them. And then there's some of the tried and true stuff just in terms of human engagement, mm -hmm. uh, marching a customer along the customer journey that worked decades ago and we should still be using now. So as we close, Gabrielle, I'd love, could you sort of give us your thoughts, the, the state of the union, according to Gabrielle, on what the, what the best of the old school is that we should hold on to and some of the best of the new school that we should start to weave in? Um, so I would say old school, those standout experiences that people remember years down the line. Um, a few years ago, we did a tailgating event where we fully branded a Sendoso RV outside. We had what? branded games. We had food catered. We gave everyone tickets to the football game. Uh, we did 49ers game, Stanford game, Giants game. Um, and we kind of went on the road show and we still have deals closing years down the line. They're like, wow. we didn't budget at the time. But now we do, we remembered your event, so we know who to contact. So those experiences that really resonate with people and make you trust your brand, have fun with your brand. Um, so those are the in-person things that I think people should continue to use. Uh, virtual platforms like this continue to try to turn, to turn those experiences, make them feel like they're still in person, have the breakout rooms, have the chat mm -hmm. rooms. Um, so that you can bring people in from all over the world. Anyone can join. They don't need to have access to resources in order to fly uh, yes. or hotels. Anyone can absorb your contact, any content, anyone can interact with your brand um, through virtual platforms like Bevy. So um, I think a mix of having both of those and that that's what I would say. <laughs> I love that. I love that, Gabrielle. Thank you so much for sharing that. Alex, we're going to circle back to you. We'll close with this same question as well. Best of the old school and best of the new school. What do you recommend? Best of old school is in person. We'll come back and it's going to come back with a vengeance. <laughs> there are going to be more challenges and we're going to be have to be more creative. Um, thinking about how we combine a hybrid and in person, you know, it shouldn't be an algorithm. It should, mm. If it is difficult for you to come up with it, think about what the experience on the other side is going to be, right? So I tend to think that if you think about it from a simple way, if it's simple, it will be simple for them as well. Mm. Um, so, you know, I think they, in, the smaller in-person gatherings are really needed. Um, people really want to connect. Uh, imagine a real team building virtually. I mean, they can happen, but there are things, body language, uh, conversations on the side, things that really think, strengthen those bonds that can only happen 
in a physical in-person way. And so mm -hmm. I think those will remain, but also leveraging the power of virtual to reach out to the masses. The same way as Facebook versus mail, right? Facebook allows a single person to have the, the ability to share a message with millions of people at the same time, right? Are you going to, I mean, people do it, but if you, if there's someone that you really care about in your life, are you going to send them a Facebook message or are you try, going to try to do something more for them? Maybe you'll want to throw a birthday party for them or send them a birthday card, right? So mm -hmm. the best of, of both worlds, depending on the type of message and you want to talk to. That's the way I see it. I love that. I love that. I love that. And, and um, Daniel, I want to sort of build on that as we close and, and ask, like the power of doing in-person events, I'm not sure whether it was you, Gabrielle, who had talked about doing this earlier, having a live in-person event, filming it, and then making that accessible virtually. Are, are folks, are your clients, Daniel, sort of thinking about doing something similar where you have the in-person event, it might be smaller, you capture it on video, you might layer on some additional production or not, but then those videos are available as on-demand content for a global audience right now our conversations haven't been like that i mean it depends it's totally about the type of event you know i don't think that a product launch or a pr event we're inviting you know media and whatnot is going to translate well into a recorded like asset that then gets watched later by people you know i mm -hmm. think in it all i think like hybrid you know people have been, I think people think hybrid, like I'm doing, like you said, like this event at the same exact time. But as Alex was saying before, it might not be like that. And as Gabrielle was saying before, you know, you're doing your portfolio. I think that there are different, you have to have a hybrid approach, like some events it makes sense for, some events it doesn't make sense for. So, you know, if you're going to be doing a sales conference, it totally makes sense to like film so much of that event because you want people to feel like they're a part of it who are not able to make it. But mm. other events, it just might not, like an activation ahead of a sports game, like Gabrielle was saying, like, I don't think filming their tailgating event is going to translate the those content Not that's going to be shared later. Yeah. So I think that, you know, it's just a matter of different types of events will need different types of like approaches, which I think is very important. Yeah, I'm really excited about, you, you guys are given so many innovative ideas mixing the old school with the new school, going back to the future, so to speak. And I, I feel like the future is bright for us field marketers, but we're gonna have to take those blinders off to Alex's point. There's more um, to the experience of engagement than traditional events. Uh, to Gabrielle's point, sales is always a partner. So we do have to make sure we, we are meeting the business's needs. And Daniel, what you're doing with your clients, I'm loving it. Uh, from, from eighth grade, look at you now. Your eighth grade classmates would have been, man, we were right. Most likely to become a successful world-changing field marketer. I, I'm sure they said that in your yearbook. Yeah, um, that's exact words. <laughs> Folks, this has been a delight. Gabrielle, Alex, Daniel, thank you for hanging out with us today. Thank you guys. Thank so you. Much. Thank you.